election of the president. What would the crime be? Uh, murder. Murder. Right? Technically also treason because it was the president. Treason, good, fine, absolutely. Right, is a basis for charging your crime. You are complicit in what somebody else did and so you can be charged with the crime they committed, whether it's murder, whether it's burglary, anything, etc. Okay? So when you, you think somebody is complicit as a prosecutor, you charge them with the crime they were complicit in. It gets complicated when it, the crime you think they were complicit in is conspiracy, but I don't, I don't want to go there right now, we will, but I want to assume it's a substantive offense that you think they helped to occur. Conspiracy, by contrast, is itself a crime with its own elements that you can charge. Smith and Jones, etc., we all conspired to steal money from the state of Kentucky. Right? That was a conspiracy. So you can be charged with conspiracy. You can also be charged with the substantive offenses that were the object of the conspiracy. So it's a plus the substantive crime, not a basis for the substantive crime. Everyone see this is really important. Every year on an exam, if I happen to give a question in which there's a multiple defendant possibility, I get people incorrectly saying, oh, we can charge them with complicity. And I have to deduct points. Because you can't. It's not a crime. Right? It's a way you can charge a crime. Conspiracy is a crime. Just full stop conspiracy. It, it doesn't have to be conspiracy to. Well, you have, you, as part of, conspiracy is the crime. As a prosecutor, you have to identify what they are conspiring to do, and what they are conspiring to do has to be illegal. But you can charge, uh, there are some limits on this, but for now, we'll get to conspiracy later, you need just know that you may charge, if you meet the requirements, you may charge both conspiracy and the substantive crimes they conspire to commit, right? Again, there are some limits on that, but if you meet those limits, you can charge both. So if the object of the conspiracy was to distribute methamphetamine, you can charge um, Ms. Clements with both conspiring to distribute methamphetamine and distributing methamphetamine. Nothing personal. Okay? Okay. For complicity, there does have to be a completed crime in which you are complicit. There does have to be a completed crime. It arises from the actions of others, because you're complicit in their offense. And your complicity can arise from an omission. It arises from your relationship to another. From your relationship to another. When, with omissions, for example, your relationship is a duty to others. Right? You have a duty to someone else, that's your relationship. So your omission can be your actus reus. Here, it's your relationship to the person who committed the crime that makes you complicit in their crime. What you do can be aid, it can be encouraged, it can be to in some way facilitate the commission of the offense. We will ask a number of questions that are suggested on pages 726 and 727. First, what kind of conduct amounts to or constitutes aiding or encouraging? What kind of conduct will be enough? What's the required mens rea for complicity? And what is the required relationship between the perpetrator and the accomplice? Because we just said there has to be some relationship. So what is that relationship? And we'll start doing that with Bocho. What happened uh, to give rise 
to this um, sort of very complicated uh, set of facts. Right, I'm going to mix up the characters. Right? Well, we'll get through it together. Okay. All right. So, um, Navarro had been arrested. Uh, he was being held at the courthouse. And that had been along with a couple of others. Uh, and they and their uh, Compost and Lovato. And why were they arrested? Uh, for breaking and entering because they'd been evicted from their home. Right. And it was a camp. Compost's home. Yeah. Had been, they had been evicted, so they. Got in, went into this house, uh, which they shouldn't have, right? Now, uh, Navarro was still being held, and he had a preliminary hearing scheduled for the morning of April 4th. Uh, and what happened? Um, you had a, so you had Leandro for, for all day, Manuel Vida, and Juan Ochoa, um, and I, I think a big group of other folks as well that got together. And this was first, before they had tried to meet with the sheriff, on April 3rd about Navarro. They wanted him to be released. The sheriff said, not a chance. Um, they asked to meet with Navarro. They, that was denied too. He said, look, his trial will take place nine o'clock tomorrow morning and you can see him then. And that was not, did not help situa the situation. It was uh, right. not sort of had the sense of how explosive uh, and tense the situation was. Uh, so what happens the next morning? So um, they had gotten together, I guess, the, the, yeah, the night before in, at the Spanish American Hall and decided that they were going to go down to the courthouse and uh, uh, as Navarro was needed and was transferred. So the, um, so the next morning they got there with about I don't know, 125 other people. And they were waiting outside the courthouse as Navarro was And Carmichael brings... Navarro, the very short distance from the jail to the courthouse. Uh -huh. <clears throat> and why was the size of this crowd a problem? Because uh, there was only 20, enough room for 25 spectators in the courthouse, so they just decided to keep everybody everybody outside. And so only witnesses. Uh, yeah, except it. for witnesses. And this, yeah. the crowd finds this even more uh, not acceptable. They pound on the doors. Uh, kick at the kick at the door, pound on the windows. Navarro said, "What happened at the hearing?" Um, oh, he <coughs> he objected that he didn't have an attorney, so uh, the judge postponed uh, in order for him to secure. Him. And what did that mean? That since the hearing or the trial isn't going to happen, what what does have to happen? got to stay in jail. And he has to be brought back there. Right. And that in and of itself raises real security concerns. Uh -huh. And so the sheriff was worried if we try to go through the front entrance, that's going to be a disaster. So what does he try to do? Um, he tries to take him out the back door into an alley. Um, <laughs> and how did that work? Uh, not very well. That's not where, very well. That's where it's kind of confusing with the, yeah, everybody uh, hitting each other and shooting at each other. Right. Uh, so, um, Gilardi is seen going through the crowd. He went into the alley at the head of the crowd, and Avicia and Ocho were in the crowd, and then in the alley, and they formed a semicircle around the rear entrance as the officers prepared to emerge. So, everyone knows what's going on, nothing works. So, what happens as this, uh, this sort of uh, uh, metaphorical match gets lit? Yeah, so, okay, so <clears throat> there's Carmichael and Dean Roberts, and they, they come out into the alley, and everybody's kind of pushing and shoving and yelling, and, uh, <laughs> and uh, um, somebody, I think it's Ochoa, strikes Dean Roberts with a claw hammer to kind of start off the, the violence, and uh, yeah, things kind of digress on that. And the crowd, somebody in the crowd shouts, we want Navarro, and then a whole bunch of things happen. Avicia draws a pistol and, uh, and rushes through the, from the rear of the crowd toward the officer. Deputy Bajas uh, observes someone in the crowd, grab at the prisoner to take him away. Bajas throws a tear gas bomb into the crowd, 
and he was then struck and rendered unconscious. Right? Yeah. Two members of the crowd tried to uh, rush to try and retrieve his gun, uh, which had fallen to the ground. What do Odija and Ochoa do mm -hmm. critically? Once after all this has happened, Baker. Uh, so Deputy Bajos is down, and Odija and Ochoa uh, are seen leaving and taking some. Star that. That's a big fact that the court relies on their behavior towards Bajas at this moment, okay? At this, basically the same time two shots are fired um, while the tear gas uh, bomb is exploding, one from behind the officers which strikes Carmichael in the body, and one right after that, apparently filed by Ignacio Velarde, the defendant's brother. It struck Carmichael in the face and through his neck. Carmichael dies instantly, the sheriff. It's very likely that the bullets that shot Carmichael and also wounded another deputy, Wilson, were fired from Bajis' gun, but it was never recovered. Somebody, presumably in the crowd, made off with it, disposed of it, we'll never know, okay? Roberts returns fire at both Ignacio, Ignacio Velarde and Solomon Esquivel, who were still firing, and he killed both of them, right? And several others are wounded. So, out of all of this, we are, the, the charges relate to the death of Carmichael and how many people are charged as culpable for Carmichael's death? Um, three. Well, you know, how many are charged? Ten. Oh, yeah. Ten are charged, right? The prosecution is sparing no expense, wants to hold anyone in sort of, no pun intended, a scattershot effort to see who, when the smoke clears, could be held culpable, okay? Uh, so, Mr. Blank, what happens? Out of those 10? Seven are dismissed. Seven are acquitted, right? So we're, though we're done with them right away. Who's convicted? Uh, Velarde, Alida, and Ochoa. And they appeal, saying that this issue should never have even gotten to the jury. It should never have even gotten to the jury, and so our, our uh, conviction should be overturned. So under what theory, or theories, does the state say that they are culpable for second degree murder? Razor? Uh, one of them actually shot and killed the sheriff. Okay, one theory is one of these people might have actually shot Carmichael. Now, how many of you sitting there think, think that, if, plus, that if that was the only theory that they could be held, that the conviction could stand. Why not, Mr. Razor? Well, two of them were seen kicking uh, the sheriff while he was down when they were in the way of shooting him, and they also were in possession of a firearm. Um, which leads to a great, that's really good, and, um, and, what, does, and, what, and, and what does that um, mean legally? What, if you were the defense lawyer, what would, what would you say that, that those factual points mean in terms of why they can't be convicted under the theory that they shot Carmichael? It's not beyond reasonable doubt. Good, right? Given these facts, at the ver maybe you can construct some theory at which they were doing two things at once, right? They were kicking and shooting, but it's sure not beyond a reasonable doubt. If all, because we don't know who shot Carmichael. It's the big unknown in this case. It was a big crowd. No one knows what was going on. No one really can speak to the details because it was all a big, all a massive confusion. So it, you cannot say beyond a reasonable doubt that any one of these people actually shot Carmichael and thus base a conviction on that, right? But that's not the prosecution's only theory and that's where we get some complicity in the deal. What is the other theory? So the prosecution has this alternative idea that even if they didn't shoot, they aided and abetted, i.e. were complicit in the shooting, whoever did it. And we don't have to know who that was to know that they aided and abetted the act. <coughs> okay? Um, so the court 
gives a bunch of guidance on what constitutes aiding and abetting. And the court says these things that I want to highlight for you. First, there's no distinction between an accessory before the fact or after the fact. How many of you have heard that phrase? An accessory after the fact. Put it out of your mind. Right? If you are an accessory, if you aid and abet, if you are complicit, when you were complicit, doesn't matter. There is no distinction between the time in which you do your aiding and abetting, in which you are complicit. Okay? It doesn't matter whether a defendant directly commits the offense, or whether he, that is the, uh, the complicity, or whether he procures, counsels, aids, or abets in its commission. You do any of those things, and you are culpable for the crime. So the principal who actually does the shooting is the same as the accessory who aids and or abets it. It's all the same, okay? So you can do it with acts. You can do it with conduct. You can do it with words. You can do it with signs. You can do it, in other words, by any means, anything which incites, encourages, instigates the commission of the offense. Okay. See how broad this language is? If you are, um, it, Ochoa is your go-to case. If you see, if you have to make as a prosecutor the argument that a defendant aided and abetted, it gives you wonderful language about how it can be anything you do, any kind of act, any kind of words, anything can constitute the kind of instigation or assistance that renders you liable for complicity, okay? Even if the, act, even if the uh, crime has already been undertaken, and even if the, aid, the uh, uh, principal doesn't know you're supporting him or her, right? If I support Ms. Clements in her methamphetamine uh, ring, I may be unknown to her behind the scenes. Helping, you know, help making sure that there's a supply of the ingredients she needs. <clears throat> and she may be like completely unaware I'm helping her. Doesn't have, she doesn't have to be aware. I'm aiding and abetting without her knowledge. Right? Doesn't, you don't even have to have the principal uh, know. I, I do have to share her criminal intent, but I can share her criminal intent whether she knows it or not. Kind of, kind of bizarre, but true. Okay. So how do these principles apply here? Mr. Razor, how do these principles apply here? What happens to each of the defendants? Uh, or each of the defendants who are appealed, not the seven who are acquitted? Uh, it's a firm for Ochoa and Vito. And what about, Bill? let's get Villardi out of the way first. What happens to Velarde's conviction? Uh, it's dismissed. Why? Even with these broad rules that, that make complicity relatively easy to prove, it doesn't hold up for Velarde. Why? Uh, the court said there was no evidence which sufficiently connects him to the unlawful design of the slaying of the sheriff. He didn't do anything, at least the evidence didn't show, that aided whoever it was, because we don't know who it was, whoever it was that shot Carmichael. What is the critical distinction between Velarde, conviction reversed, and Avicia and Ochoa? The kicking of Edwin Fox. That seems like a stretch. Yes, that's the key. That's the distinction for sure. Why is that so important? Or how does the court link the assault on Bajas to aiding and abetting the death of Carmichael? I'm sorry? There was no uh, testimony by any of the witnesses that he was seen anywhere near. That's Velarde. Tell me about Avicia and Ochoa. Uh, Why does the assault on Bajas tie them to the crime in a way lacking for Velarde? Uh, they helped in the commission of the killing by uh, kicking a deputy when he would have come to the aid of the sheriff. So the link is, very good, the link is Carmichael is shot. The court says, look, a jury could conclude 
that what would happen under ideal circumstances at least once Carmichael is shot? Uh, Fox would have returned fire and helped Carmichael? Well, yeah. Fodges would have taken steps, we'll just say that for now, to aid Carmichael. He might have returned fire. He might have gone to his aid and re tried to render as medical assistance, right? Called for medical assistance. He would have done something that you would have expected a deputy to come to the aid of a fallen sheriff, right? And, what, and how did the assault on Bodges aid in the death of Carmichael? It kept him from doing that. It kept him from doing that. If, okay, everyone see that? Right, everyone see that? So um, that seemed like a stretch, right? It's part of this whole melee, it's part of this whole um, uh, uh, unfolding chaos, but you can link them together and say that a jury at least could have found, we don't have this for Velarde, but we do have it for Avicia and Ochoa, a jury could have found that this was done not just to assault Bodges in and of itself, but with the intent to prevent what would have been assistance to Carmichael. What's the, if you read all that, let's say you buy all that, what's the, um, what's the, Fly in the ointment. What's the weakness of that argument? The sheriff died instantly. Good. Well, now I'm not saying it's good that the sheriff died instantly. <laughs> but yes, the sheriff died instantly, so any assistance that we are sort of supposing Bodges would have rendered, and that they, and by assaulting him and rendering him unconscious, prevented him from rendering, was irrelevant to the accomplishment of the crime they are alleged to have been complicit in. And what's the answer to that? What's the answer to the fact that their assistance meant nothing, did not actually uh, um, facilitate the accomplishment of the death of Carmichael, which was instant and would have happened anyway? They shared the intent, but did they actually aid? Okay, we got the intent hurdle cleared. I'm, story, I'm suggesting that there should, maybe there should be another hurdle that, okay, you had the intent, but hey, he, since he died instantly, it doesn't matter that you have the intent because you didn't actually aid in a bet. You didn't actually aid in a bet. It says that they could elect so to find the defendant's assault on the assailant and attempt, or started, to, started the attack on Bob's in an attempt to... In an attempt to, but did they actually aid in the bet? Let me sort of just cut to the chase because it's not really revealed by this case, but we will see it later. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you actually aid. That's how broad aiding and abetting can be. And if you share the intent and take an action, at the very least in many jurisdictions you can be uh, charged with attempting to commit the crime because you attempted to aid and abet, and in other jurisdictions, you can actually be charged with aiding and abetting even if you actually rendered no assistance, and even if your assistance was not necessary to the completion of the crime, okay? They don't, in other words, have to actually cause the death. If you look at note one on page 777, you will see that they don't have to have actually caused the death of Carmichael. Is that why uh, the court, uh, what the court means by as long as they show an outward manifestation of their uh, intent, then it really doesn't matter their act? Yeah, the only time when, um, when um, not really rendering aid, that is you don't actually aid the commission of the crime, is uh, a defense or renders you not culpable via complicity is where you didn't actually act. Right? We have a situation where you refrain from acting. In that case, if you're refraining from acting, doesn't provide aid, then it does limit your culpability. Ms. Call. Does the fact that um, the officer was unconscious when he went down kind of hurt the theory that he would have gone to the aid of the sheriff? 
it, it's not whether he would have gone to the aid. It's that the jury could have concluded that Avicii and Ochoa beat and kicked him to prevent him from doing it. Right? Maybe under the facts, we know in hindsight that he was unconscious and couldn't have gone to his aid. But they, their thinking at the time still could have been, this guy might get up. It, well, I don't know. Is he out cold? Is he just <clears throat> dazed? We're going to beat him to make sure he can't go help Carmichael. Is that a stretch on the facts? I certainly think it's a stretch. But remember, on appeal, you look at the facts in the favorable most like to the jury verdict and ask whether there is any reasonable construction of the facts that would have supported the verdict. Right? So where the trial, the prosecution has the burden of proof beyond a reasonable doubt, bad for prosecution, on appeal from a conviction, all the presumptions get turned the other way. And we ask, well, is it possible that the jury could have thought that this was what they were doing, that they were acting in order to prevent botches from going to Carmichael? Is that the most likely construction of the facts? I would sure say no. The most likely construction of the facts was they beat botches because they wanted to beat botches. And it was disconnected from any, any, um, uh, any thoughts about Carmichael having been shot. But could the jury have found that? Mm, well, yeah, I guess. And that's all you need to be able to affirm the conviction. Okay? And that takes us to the talents and the skeletons. And one of the most um, amazing cases uh, that you'll ever read. Uh, by the way, this was not actually a murder prosecution. It sort of would seem like it was from the way it was presented in the book. This was an ethics complaint against Judge Talley, right? That he violated the code of judicial ethics by being complicit in a murder. Which, whatever you might think about the rules of judicial ethics, that certainly qualifies as a problem. So that's what the court was actually looking at here. Was not, oh, he was convicted of murder, do we affirm the conviction? But was he complicit for the sake of deciding did he violate judicial ethics? Okay? So who was our who was um, who was killed here? Clements? Who was killed? Um, Mr. Ross. R. C. Ross. And who killed him? Uh, and why did they kill him, this, uh, the, gang, the skeleton gang? He had a bit of an affair with uh, their sister. He was, I love the way the court phrases this. This is so 1894. He had seduced or been criminally intimate with a sister of the skeletons, right? That's how you get the brother-in-law thing. And uh, a, a sister of three of them and of Mrs. Talon, right? A sister of the judge. Um, so, uh, so he was therefore a brother-in-law of the skeletons. So Ross, having uh, angered them, was hiding out uh, for a while, right, laying low. What mistake did he make? Um, well, he uh, traveled by carriage um, from Scottsboro to Stevenson, and he says James Skelton, who lived with him, um, like saw him. The skeleton, right, the skeletons got wind of him trying to get from Scottsboro to Stevenson on January 30th. So Skelton James, that is, gets a gun and by horse with two other Skeltons, Robert and Sean, follows along by horse. Now you're Ross. What do you, you're in your carriage. What do you think? Do they know where I am and what's going on? And, and you're probably thinking, I got away with this. I made my oh, yeah. escape. For as far as you know, they are completely unaware. So they have a huge advantage. Right? They're following him in the carriage, and they're going to catch the carriage. And he's just blissfully unaware of the threat that, um, that is uh, catching up to him. Okay. Um, and everyone was aware, other than Ross, that a chase was on. There was a probability of a terrible tragedy on the road to Stevenson or back in Stevenson. So while all this is unfolding, what does our friend Judge Talley do? Uh, he does a lot to stop a message from getting to Ross. Um, well, let's don't jump 
the gun. We get, we'll get to the message to Ross in a minute. He, where is he? Um, well, he ends up at the, where the telegram is going to be sent. The telegraph office, um, yes. Mm -hmm. And he's talking to his friend, Dr. Rorex. And Dr. Rorex basically uh, is, um, is a rat. He tells on poor Judge Kelly. And what did Rorex say? Uh, he said we better send a hack and a physician. Uh, I'm not sure what a hack is, but he says, like, we need to send somebody to assist them because obviously something bad's going to happen. Uh, somebody might get hurt, they're going to need assistance. And what did Tally say when said, Rorex said, you know what? This looks like a bad thing about to unfold. Let's get some assistance. Let's intervene in a way that might prevent the violence. What did Tally say? Um, he said his friends could. Because who, does he care about Ross? No. <laughs> no, he doesn't care about Ross at all. So we don't need assistance for, for the thing I care about. And uh, and then he said, we ought to send a telegram to Stevens and have all of them arrested. <laughs> that is Rorex. And what does Tally say about that? He doesn't reply to that directly, but then said he was waiting to see if anybody uh, had sent a telegram to that. So if anybody shows up who tries to send a telegram, that's what Tally's there to monitor. Right? And eventually, who does show up? Uh, surprise, surprise, at the telegraph office. E.H. Ross, um, who seems to be a relative of Ross. Um, and he has a message addressed to R.C. Ross, who is on the run, that says, four men on horseback with guns following, look out. And he gives this to the telegraph operator. And this is pretty good warning, as good a warning as Ross could hope for, that he's in trouble and that he should do whatever he can, and in some circumstances it might be effective, uh, to avoid this problem. What does, uh, after R.C. Ross gives this to the telegraph operator, what does Tally do? Um, well, he asks Judge Bridges, who is, so is still in the office, um, what do you think the operator would think if I told him to, uh, if I told him that I should put him out of that office for which which sounds like kick him out or get him fired or leave. Um, and he's kind of told by the Bridges judge, I wouldn't do that. I might cause you some serious trouble. So don't interfere with the sending of uh, R.C. Ross's me message. So if he's not going to do that, what is, what, since he doesn't do that, Ms. Prosecutor, what are you going to use that testimony for? Since he, even though he asked about interfering with the sending of Ross's message, he didn't do it. What are you going to use that for? Anything? Um, well, I mean, he was warned not to do that one thing, which he, he didn't. He didn't do so. He like didn't directly stop it, but it's like you can tell by him staying there and doing other things that he's still thinking how to get around it. Good. It is evidence of his what he's of his thinking, mm -hmm. of his intent, and he's looking for anything he can do the most he can do that will accomplish the goal of assisting the skeletons in their pursuit and ultimately their assault, deadly assault, on Ross. Right? So it tells, helps to show what his thinking was, bless you, behind his actions later. What were his actions later? Uh, to send a different message that says, even though like, this message just came through, um, not let the party warned in that previous message good way. Um, and it says this message has something to do with the one that you just received. And Huddleston who did he send that to? To Huddleston. Who was? Uh, who, is he the, uh, the other telegraph? He runs the telegraph office in Stevenson. And why? what is significant about Huddleston? Uh, well, he's the one who would have sent out the Well, message. yes, but what else is significant about him? I think they were friends, right? Who's the they? Tally and He's a long time friend of Tally's. So Tally could expect that Huddleston might be very receptive to this message. Take my side, mm -hmm. right? Whatever you see in this other message, ignore that, right? Ignore that death behind the curtain. This is what you want to do, right? So Tally is taking advantage of the situation, taking advantage of his contact, and he's going to get this done, okay? Um, so, um, and he said, oh, he also says, say nothing, say nothing. So both messages are sent around 10.25 a.m., Tally then leaves. <coughs> he, hasn't, he hasn't 
succeeded in preventing anyone from warning Ross, but he has sent a message of his own to try and aid the skeletons. So what happens ultimately in Stevenson? Uh, the skeletons shoot him. They shoot, oh, three of them shoot at him. Um, he's wounded, so he runs for cover behind the building, and then he's shot in the head from behind by one of the other skeletons. And Robert Skelton telegraphs back to Tally Ross is dead and the skeletons are fine. All is right with the world, right? All is right with the world. This scoundrel who, A, is, uh, is uh, he's smirching the honor of our family, and B, then try to run and hide the coward, he's dead. Got what he deserved, right? That's what they do, okay? So we'll stop there, having set the factual predicate. And we will talk about if and how Callie can be said to be complicit on the game. I have to go see what's okay. What do you think? Oh, then I'm going to get the other one. Well, I just realized I was going to get the other one. In Frankfurt. Where's Frankfurt? Where are Frankfurt is like 30, 30, 45 minutes from here.